then go. Hello, it's a great pleasure to be here for the space between the words, cartographies of Ivan Boland's poetry and Anne Enright's fiction in Hispanic America with Professor Mario Murgia and Professor Dr. Aurora Pinheiro. Um, uh, I want to say that, so thank you very much both for joining us. And I want to say Professor Murgia is a poet, a translator, a full professor of English at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He has many publications, among them um, Lines Written in Water, The Influence of Paradise Lost in, on By uh, Byron, Keats and Shelley, um, Singularly Remote, Essays on Poetry, uh, May the World Forgive an Anthology of Poetry, and many uh, translations of other writers, particularly poets, uh, he co-edited with Angelica Durham uh, the volume Global Milton and the Visual Art. And the forthcoming one is The Green Leaf of Language, Contemporary Anglo-Irish Poetry, which is going to be an e-volume. Um, and I'm so much looking forward to reading it. And Dr. Aurora Pinheiro is full professor in the English department at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And her main academic fields are contemporary Irish narrative, postmodern novels in English, uh, and Gothic literature. She's a member of the ISU, um, the IADA, and the IGA, International Gothic Association. She's the author of El Gothico y su legado en el terror, and editor of Rewriting Traditions, Contemporary Irish Fiction, and author of many other articles on Benview, on Gothic studies, and now she's the co-head of the Even Bowen and Enright Irish Studies Chair at the University uh, Autonomous University of Mexico. So a uh, big welcome. Thank you very much. And I pass on the words to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giselle. And, and thank you to all the organizing committee and especially to Professor uh, Isarra. Who, who invited us to take part in this extraordinary conference. Thank you very much. So um, uh, the title of today's uh, uh, presentation is The Space Between the Words, Cartographies of Evan Voland's Poetry and Anne M. Wright's Fiction in Hispanic America. A map is an artifact that makes it possible for a reality to be recreated from a subjective point of view and usually with a specific purpose in mind. In terms of literary cartographies, a map may be understood as a poetic notion of self in the world, a way to negotiate potential locations and transitory representations. The aim of this lecture is to analyze an ensemble of poems by Evan Boland, as well as the novel Actress by Anne Enright from the perspective of a threefold notion of literary mapping. Firstly, the author's role as a cartographer when her lexicon is imbued with the language of landscape and thus creates an imagery which may articulate a literary territory of her own or even a geography of effects. Secondly, when the reader or critic exacts a map from the literary works and this visual representation enables an additional reading of the text or set of texts. And finally, when a specific type of reader, the translator, makes a literary work migrate to different linguistic and cultural spheres, and in this way, she, he contributes to the creation or expansion of the cartographies of literary reception. In the context of Hispanic America, the translational pathways that Boland's poetry has traveled in Mexico will be a case in point, as Eva Cruz anthology or anthologia remains the only single author volume of Boland's translated poetry in that region or the world. As for Enright's recent fiction and nonfiction writings, the, contribu the contributions of a group of Mexican translators to the new Anne Enright Ephesus project will be discussed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for 
for being here. And I will now share my screen if you don't mind. So this is the space between the words, cartographies of Evan Boland, of Evan Boland's poetry and Anne Rand Wright's fiction in Hispanic America. Um, many a great poet of our time, and indeed of all times and climes, has been more or less aware of the, of the phenomenon of uh, poetical exchange, as well as of the repercussions of the practice in the human imagination and psyche. A good example of this is Octavio Paz, the only ever Mexican recipient of the Nobel Prize for Literature. In an essay entitled Literatura y Literalidad, or liter Literature and Literalness, Paz writes at length of the manner in which certain poets of great note take delight in the intricacies of geographically and symbolically laden lang language, for instance. After discussing the potential untranslatability or translatability of Miguel de Unamuno's succinct piece, Avila, Malaga, Cáceres, Paz manages to discover its poetical and transcultural equivalent in Description Without Place by the American poet Wallace Stevens. The Mexican essayist and poet quotes a few lines from Stevens's lyric and immediately after that states that, unquote, the language of both Unamuno and Stevens becomes a landscape and these landscape in turn is an invention, the metaphor of a, na of a nation or an individual. A verbal topography where everything is interconnected, where everything is a translation. The phrases are a ridge of mountains and the mountains are the signs, the ideograms of a civilization. It is undeniable that Pass's cartography inspired ruminations and verse, verse writing and poetry translation have filtered either consciously or not through the notions and practices of a number of other Mexican uh, men and women of letters, poet translators and scholars. This seems to be particularly true of the members of the Seminario Permanente de Traducción Literaria or Permanent Seminar of Literary Translation of the School of Philosophy and Literature at Mexico's National University, or UNAM. For nearly 30 years now, and by means of translation, the Seminario has explored the possibilities in Mexican Spanish of Anglophone political traditions, such as those of the United States, England, and Scotland in, in anthologies like Más de dos siglos de poesía norteamericana, over two centuries of North American poetry, uh, from Hardy to Heaney, 20th century English poetry, and more recently, um, Thistles and Rain, an anthology of contemporary Scottish poetry. In the context of Spanish-speaking America, the seminario's exploration of modern and contemporary Irish poetry has been especially significant. A dual language volume focusing exclusively on 20th century Irish poetry, Una Lengua Injertada, or A Grafted Tongue, appeared in 2003 and was the first anthology of its kind ever to be published in Mexico. In their selection of the poets and poems, the members of the seminario were careful to underscore the age-old interconnection between the island's verse and um, the character-determining notions, uh, character determining notions such as the motherland, emigration, and geographical replacement and displacement. The prologue to the book, penned by the late Professor Jose Juan Davila Sota, is quite explicit with regard to the themes and topics that the group of translators were faced, were faced with over the course of their enterprise. Quote, the struggle for the land in Ireland turned the land itself, as well as the landscape, into important topics. Similarly, tropes retrieved from the distant past by several authors of the 19th century had mutated into the nostalgia and sadness expressed in an iconography that in some cases is still current. But most of all, the problems of identity, the atrocious consequences of war and the intense imagination are fertile territories where poetry blossoms in everyday experience and delights us with its intensity. It is thus that contemporary Irish poetry has become one of the most vital and interesting experiences of our time." End quote. No Mexican translation, no Mexican translator of Irish poetry, as is evident from the prologue to Una Lengua Injertada, could possibly remain oblivious to such defining motives and themes. So far, I have placed emphasis upon the use of terms such as cartography, map, and also landscape. 
Such an insistence has to do with the representation of possibilities inherent in the poetry of a number of modern and contemporary Irish and Mexican poets. These representation of possibilities articulate a chart of the imagination that in turn expresses itself in terms of cartographic imagery, or in other words, the poetical configuration or reconfiguration of place. In the case of Una Lengua Injertada, these interconnections are particularly momentous in the context of contemporary Mexican and Hispano-American literature, not only because the volumes contributors pioneered the translation of important late 20th century Anglophone Irish poetry in much of the region, but also because they were careful to present to their audience the poetical work of Evan Boland. The translation of Boland's verse for Una Lengua Injertada was undertaken by the Mexican scholar and translator Eva Cruz Yanez whose selection encompasses the pieces Child of Our Time, The Muse Mother, The Muse Mother, Miss Ere, The Women, Outside History, and Time and Violence. Very much in tune with the anthology scope as outlined by Jose Juan Davila, Cruz's choices point to an interest in the translational exploration of at least two of Boland's most pressing concerns. That is to say, identity, whether it be defined by gender, nationality, or both, and either personal or collective history. Eva Cruz's choices already evidence her sensitivity to the poet's express need to voice the personal and topical singularities of her craft. Clearly, Cruz's purpose is perceivable in terms not only of dissemination, but of thematic and stylistic representativeness as well. The inclusion of a piece like uh, Muse Mother in Una Lingua Injertada is an evident example of the manners in which Cruz's translation and strategies function by procuring an equivalence in the target language of the original English. The poem's opening lines are as follows. Well, th that is the cover and the back cover of Una Lengua Injertada so that you can see it. And the poem goes like this. You can read it in English and in Spanish here. The speaker of the poem presents a scene from afar, an everyday action, a motherly gesture. It becomes the focus of the nearly impressionistic depiction of an unassuming event on the drizzly outside. The lines are brisk and short, but the first two images contained in them and whose conventional complexity is only enhanced by an unusual verbalization of nouns. That is, for example, to pearl, my window pearls wet, and to bury, the bare rowan tree there is rain. Those expressions announce the unequivocal um, expression of what Lucy Collins, in referring to Boland's imagistic capabilities, has called, quote, the distillation of the image, the self-conscious transformation of life into art, end quote. In Eva Cruz's Spanish, however, such visual distillation runs backward due to the syntactical needs of the target language. The Mexican translation, uh, a verse, and I will read it out in Spanish if you allow me. La humedad perla mi ventana, en el cerval desnudo, frutas de lluvia. Desde aquí puedo ver a una mujer inclinada. Su activa mano restriega la cara de un niño. Pasa una toallita desechable sobre la redondez de su boca pegajosa y gritona. In the first line, the only full coincidence between the English and the Spanish is the very poetic use of the Spanish verb perlar clearly borrowed from the noun perla, or pearl, which is hardly uh, necessary to retranslate into English. Other than that, and except for its evocative constitution, the Spanish line is imagistically independent, but not referentially estranged from that in English. The agent here is not the window, but the wet, or la humedad. As for the ensuing image of the tree burying the rain, Cruz decides to rid the lines of the verb altogether, thus converting Boland's fleeting act of fruition into a haiku-esque glimpse of frozen momentariness. On the bare rowan tree, fruits of rain. Notice the more generic noun substituting berry. In the second cluster of lines, spatially, um, the second set of lines is equally reversed in almost unnoticeable syntactical conversion. Where Boland privileges the speaker's sensoriality, I can see from where I stand, notice the second stanza. Cruz favors the poetical on Lucre's location. Desde aquí puedo ver. From here, I can see. 
Similarly, where the round shape of the baby's mouth takes imagistic precedence in English, the Spanish presents the mouth itself as the very center of the picture with two adjectives, pegajosa and gritona, qualifying it rather than its form. In the second half of the piece, the poem's eye travels from the outside to the inside, from the perception of the other to the linguistic ruminations of the self. Let us consider these lines. Again, both in English and in Spanish. A mother who has now metamorphosed into the memory of the speaker's own motherly figure embodies the intricacies of language, a language that is as revelatory as its defining of present and future self. Here, Cruz's translated lines remain closer to the original than do those in the first half. The Spanish follows very strictly the rhythms, the evocative force, the word order, and even the nostalgic visuality of Boland's English until it reaches the closing line. Pero mi pensamiento se queda fijo. Si tan solo pudiera declinar la sustantivo perdido fuera de contexto, extraviada figura de lenguaje, donde esta calle lluviosa, de nuevo hasta sus raíces, quizá me enseñara un nuevo lenguaje. Hacer una sibila capaz de cantar el pasado en sílabas puras, iluminando himnos cantados al trigo fecundo o a una mujer, capaz de hablar al fin la lengua de mi madre. Here the translator has transformed the speaker's mother tongue into the language of her mother. At first glance, the variation seems innocuous. However, the shift from the inescapability of a language acquired in a critical stage of childhood to what seems to represent an intimate linguistic heredity actually implies a drastic modification of the speaker's evocational and poetical focus. Quote, we had a common bond, not a common language, end quote, states Boland, when reminiscing about the particular relationship with her mother, a painter of considerable talent. Indeed, the Spanish translation of news mother at its closure has exceeded the possibilities of equivalence to lodge itself in the territory of re presentation. It is hard to determine whether Cruz has achieved this either consciously or rather inadvertently. Is mothers a simple typo in the facing page edition? But in her rendition of the poem, the bond between mother and daughter has been strengthened, tightened. Since the boundaries between the two female figures have been blurred by the poetological mediation of translated language, the realms of motherhood and daughterhood a past and present, constitute now common ground in the Spanish poem. La Madre Musa pres preserves and reproduces in careful detail the semantic associations as well as the rhetorical nuances of the muse mother. Cruz's respect for adjective placement is evident. For instance, uh, and the powerful rhetorical sibyl's pure syllables, civila syllabas, of the second to last stanza remain untouched, if interlingually transported in their exalted place. Cruz has methodically charted in a new language, the nooks and crannies of Berlin's poetic memory. As I have suggested, and despite some significant inversions, the carrying over conducted by Eva Cruz of Berlin's five poems to the Spanish of Una Lengua Injertada is largely conservative as regards its translation and scope. It might as well be ventured that Cruz here fits for a few slight poetical, with a few slight poetical licenses, the archetype of the faithful translator, who, quote, translates the way she does out of reverence for the cultural prestige the original has acquired. The greater the prestige, the more grammatical and logical the translation is likely to be, and quote, this is a, a quote from the fever. Such authorial and translational respect is expressed in the opening lines of Cruz's groundbreaking bilingual anthology of, of Evan Berlin's poetry, published also in 2003 by the independent Mexican press, El Tucán de Virginia. Now quote from there. Evan Berlin is currently one of the most prestigious poets both in Ireland and abroad. This is what Cruz says of Berlin. Critic, um, 
Critics have placed her among the poets who have exerted greater influence on younger generations and who have contributed most significantly to the transformation and enrichment of Ireland's contemporary poetry tradition, end quote. It is the poet's towering statue that more often than not determines the approaches with which translators are to tackle the texts they have chosen to rewrite or which have been assigned to them to render into other languages. Even though in her prologue, Eva Cruz is unfortunately uh, laconic about the translational concerns that she has, um, the ideological and poetological conditions imposed by the poet's image, as well as the certainty of being the first, naturally have dictated her process. The extensive authorial presentation of Bolan, which Cruz undertakes with her book of translations, is clearly intended to fill a need of sorts in the target language and culture. And this particular, in this particular case, such need is as much literary as it is gender driven. Um, I'll quote Cruz again. Boland's poetics and her poetry were a breath of fresh air in the male dominated panorama of English, of Irish poetry at the same time, the late 20th century, end quote. This surely comes as no surprise if we are to point out that the Irish verse of the last five or six decades and particularly that written by women um, it's used in that kind of poetry, it's used such, a lens, such as landscape and language are almost inevitably linked with the gender that the poet has, and of course, with their identity. It follows that the aesthetic interests and choices of poetry translators, particularly female translators, as is the case of Eva Cruz herself and other members of the Seminario Permanente, should parallel these cultural and thematic tendencies. Cruz's translation of one of Boland's most famous and discussed pieces, that the science of cartography is limited, where map and poem become nearly indistinguishable in metaphorical and symbolical terms, deserves some consideration here. Even reading it, Boland's poem behaves like a map. The first line, which is also its title, separates the factual certainty it contains, that is to say the science of cartography is limited, from the powerful sensory evocations of its first stanza. If indeed the cluster of lines can be called a stanza at all, that the science of cartography is limited and not simply by the fact that this shading of forest cannot show the fragrance of balsam, the gloom of cypresses is what I wish to prove. The title, which is also the first line, functions as both a represented boundary and an indication of continuity, of direction. The poem from the very start establishes its own complex frontiers and those of one of its subjects, as it also overflows them. A clear intention is set, and yet its realization is never restricted by predefined metrics or measures. Even though the piece is a poem of remembrance and pain, it deals with an encounter with one of the infamous famine roads of Ireland. The symbolical substance of its opening verses offers restoration. The balsam, the, the balsam is a healing substance. It also provides comfort since the cypresses represent mourning and the process of recovery after the great suffering caused by a tragedy of historical proportions. The speaker is at once an Irish woman and all of the Irish all together in the restricted area of a few lines, 28 to be precise. These lines read as follows in the translation. Que la ciencia de la cartografía es limitada y no solamente porque este matiz de bosque no puede mostrar la fragancia del bálsamo, la penumbra de los cipreses, es lo que quiero probar. Once again, the faithfulness that Cruz apparently lends to Boland's English is indeed deceitful, the semantic nuances of the view of Cruz's equivalences actually contribute to illustrate what the Czech literary theoretician and translatologist Giorgi Levy has called, quote, the expression of the translator's creative individuality, end quote, which in turn constitutes, quote again, the contribution of the translator's personal style and interpretation to the resultant structure of the work, end quote. The choice of Matisse for shading is a case in point. While the latter refers directly in English to a cartographic symbol, the former, 
indeed shade, but also hue or tint, implies in Spanish the perception of a fading spectrum of color, which enhances the already suggestive visuality of the poem and its implications in the cartographic motives of the whole piece. Further on in the fourth line, the verb probar, which literally translates as to prove, not only signifies to demonstrate in Cruz's translation, but it also echoes here a need to experience and even justify the bluntness of the title or first line. Boland's memory of a painful rediscovery, both in her own mind and on the map, has become Cruz's search for an encounter with Imagistic, an imagistic sensitivity in the heightened possibilities of spirited translation that works as a respectful yet highly suggestive rewriting. Gradually and quite unassumingly, Cruz transitions from translational conservativeness to evocative reinventiveness as her acquaintance with Boland's poetics develops. Have Boland and Cruz via her translation prove that in fact, the science of cartography is limited? Yes, but cartography is limited only insofar as the map that it produces is taken literally as a means or artifact of physical localization. Only when the map is realized as a symbol, as a conglomerate of evocative remembrances, does it fulfill its ultimate purpose, that is, the internalization of a transcendental experience of the world and in the world. It is never so I can say, but to tell myself again. Nunca es de modo que pueda decir, sino para repetirme una vez más. The spaces between the worlds and indeed the words, just like the spaces between languages, are being poetically and translationally filled. Obviously, the few poems that have been discussed here, along with the translations dash rewritings, hardly, ser hardly serve to characterize the expanding possibilities of the intercommunicative correspondences between the cultures and poetics represented respectively by Evan Boland and Eva Cruz. Notwithstanding this, and taking the Mexican translators' reworkings as a starting point, the um, the mapping of Boland's verse in Spanish-speaking America seems a promising undertaking that still strives to reveal uncharted political territories. Thank you, Mario. And I'll take it for, uh, from here. And uh, if you please give me a couple of seconds, I will start sharing screen and move to the point where uh, I'm going to expand it. And here we are. As Professor Murja has stated before, some of the recurrent themes in Evan defined by gender, ethnicity, or some other standpoint, history or historiographies, both individual and collective, and mother-daughter mother relationships, either in an immediate textual uh, present or in a struggle to articulate a mother figure that implies an excavation in the territories of memory and the remains of the past. And this is also the case when it comes to Anne and Wright's writings. <clears throat> Anne and Wright's novels are characterized by a relentless use of irony, the loving attention to detail, and a paradoxical acknowledgement of both cruelty and the beauty of living things. Her latest novel, Actress, which uh, the, the cover may be seen here, her latest novel, Actress, published in 2020, bears witness to the, form, to the former attributes. This is a story narrated by Nora, a 58 years old writer who decides to write a book on her mother, Catherine O'Dell, who was an Irish theater le legend. As Nora delves into her mother's past, 
she faces the material and emotional difficulties of articulating a representation of the maternal figure, in particular when that figure is an actress, someone who was at her most real on stage or equally playing a role off stage. I think I mentioned that my mother was a star, not just on screen or on the stage, but at, this, but, but at the breakfast table also. My mother, Catherine O'Dell, was a star, end quote. As the novel develops, readers learn that Nora is not only in a search for her mother's past, but also for her father's identity. The reason why her mother shot Boyd O'Neill, the filmmaker, in the foot, and she's even trying to unravel the mystery of love, be it filial or romantic. The story is, in many ways, a coming-of-age novel where individual and collective notions and identity are explored as Nora plays the roles of memoirist, journalist, critic, and daughter, while she also comes to terms with her own role as a mother of two grown-ups, a daughter and a son. Uh, but the focus of my analysis here is the fact that these varied and braided searches are characterized, among other strategies, by the authorial decision to use a cartographic imagery, that is, a lexicon imbued with the language of landscape and maps, which articulates and challenges, at the same time, a possible individual identity, that of Catherine O'Dell. A collective notion on identity, as O'Dell's Irishness is portrayed as a construct, and even a, ge a geography of effects as this task is undertaken by Odell's daughter. Yet, Nora, uh, sorry, when, when Nora decides that she will write her book, her own version of her mother's life, she flies to London in order to conduct her research. And this is the beginning of the un unveiling of secrets, as the first confession has to do with the fact that her mother had been born in England. Quote, Yes, Catherine O'Dell, the most Irish actress in the world, was te technically British, end quote. In the same fashion, readers learned that the original name of the famous actress was Catherine Anne Fitzmaurice, and that she had been brought up in London until the outbreak of war in 1939, when, when her parents moved the family to Ireland. Her parents were itinerant stage actors, so she spends eight years traveling through the island, an episode which provides readers with a geography of the country in the 40s. In 1947, she, she was back in London, and in 1948, she had already moved to New York, where she was constructed as an Irish woman. She was told to enhance or adopt an Irish accent, to dye her hair red, and to change her stage name, name which, by then, which was by then Catherine O'Dell, after her mother's name, but was added an apostrophe to turn it into O'Dell. Thus, the most iconic of, of mid-century Irish actresses was born. The novel offers detailed accounts of Catherine's trips and her life in several cities and countries, which articulates an even larger map of her existence and a parallel depiction of the life of her daughter who had been taken to Dublin and left there under the, under the care of a nanny, Kitty McGrain. The intermittent maternal visits or stays in Ireland were always a source of excitement, but the absences are the gaps that Nora, as daughter and biographer, is trying to fill in. She reads her mother's papers, cites photographs and newspaper clippings, but acknowledges the fact that, quote, documentary evidence contains its own fictions, end quote. Even when she describes a photograph of her, uh, of one of her birthday parties in Dublin with her mother by her side, she insists on how it was all staged, on how the picture, I quote, the picture was such a fake. But, quote again, the years have made it somehow true, end quote. This way, the novel exhibits, uh, exhibits identity as a deliberate construct 
both in terms of individuals' choices as well as cultural commonplaces and official historiographies, including the, explo the exploitation of an American nostalgia for an Irishness, Irishness that had been narrowed down or trivialized. Uh, even Catherine's pol political stand for a united Ireland during the troubles is made relative by her daughter's impossibility to pin down the reasons behind that position. It is never clear for her daughter if the actress was romantically involved with an I IRA man, if she was playing the role of the Irish patriot for the eyes of her world audience, or, or if she was truly committed to the cause. But coming back to the imagery of how this, all, this is all narrated with a vocabulary that favors the language of landscape and maps, I move back to Nora's trip to England in search of the house where her mother had been born in Herne Hill, a, a London suburb. The visit to the house is described in the following terms. I liked facts, maps, arithmetic and science which was perhaps another reason for my sudden pilgrimage to Fernhill. I have always found reality very reassuring. It was an enormous comfort to touch the actual door behind which she was born, to feel how dense the wood was with, with being real, to sense through the tips of my fingers it, its exact temperature, the dark green paint on its surface poured matte by years of weather, this, this. The previous transitory sense of veracity will be constantly challenged by the text, apart from the fact that the materiality of the experience quoted above is soon substituted on the same page by a geography of effects described as uncharted territory. I was 50 years old. In a few months, I would turn 59, which was one birthday more than she had managed on this earth. I would spin beyond her out into uncharted space. I was about to become older than my own mother. The unknown land of existence as a woman beyond the maternal figure escapes the illusory precision of facts, maps, arithmetic, and science. However, both Nora's and Catherine's lives are characterized by the transgression of the social standards of their temporarily juxtaposed, but also different times. And the crossing of, of borderlines is embodied in several detailed descriptions of travels across borders, of airplane flights from where a character describes Ireland from a different perspective, as it is done by Nora on her way to England. I looked from the plane at the distance, dappled sting of the Irish sea slashed into a point here and there by the prow of a tiny boat. Thank God we're surrounded by water. No one knew where she was born. No one could ever know. It was a great and complicated secret. I wondered as I crossed over this simple stretch of blue why she went to so much trouble. Here again, the language of landscape, the crossing from one territory into another, is intertwined with the theme of individuality, individual and collective identity, as well as with a geography of affects. As, and this initial description of the sea becomes particularly meaningful because by the end of the novel, the narrator includes another long description of a seascape where the lexicon associated to the natural world, the oblique or altered reference to Ireland as the Emerald Island, the maternal figure and Nora as a mature woman and accomplished narrator come together. I quote only a fragment. The sea was on my left. The railings that run along the promenade stretched in a line, regular and familiar, for half a mile. It was wild enough. I could, I could see the rain in a slicing vertical haze heading towards the shore, and the water was already choppy. Squall was coming. The waves were busy and blurred over by the flying points of spray under which the water was, was sometimes jade, 
sometimes the color of the dark stone on my mother's ring. But exactly, the sea was the color of a black emerald. It held the light so deep in itself. And this fact flooded me with the memory of the days she spent dying when my mother was so essentially herself, I could not consider turning to leave the room. The added layers of maturity acquired by the narrative voice make this transition possible from the initial simple stretch of blue to the complex and unstable polychromy of a sea, sometimes jade, sometimes the color of a black emerald. The jargon of natural phenomena as it is used by geographers is extended to the metaphorical representation of the mother as both a dark sea or a dark stone, which held the light so deep in itself. And it also extends to the narrator as she is flooded with the memory of her dying mother. This moment of acceptance of the complexities and paradoxes of human existence is complemented by the realization of the unknowability of the past or the inconsistencies of our restricted access to it. And I quote here, but I had, as I turned for home, a great sense of the world's generosity, even though it was just my own hopefulness in another guise even though the sea was just the sea, which was quite enough, really. The sea was certainly sufficient. The way in which Enright uses cartographic images of the crossings of borderlines and the language of seascapes or landscapes in this novel is not an isolated strategy. It is, in fact, a recurrent one in her novels, which takes me to the second level of literary mapping that where the reader or critic exacts a map from more than one literary work and this visual representation enables an additional reading of a set of, of a set of texts i will limit my selection of examples to two references taken from two previous novels by Enright, the gathering which was published in 2007 and the green road from 2015. In The Gathering, Veronica, the protagonist, also flies from Ireland to England, though here in order to collect her dead brother, brother's body. And again, the main character is in a search for answers about her brother's life as it is and its unexpected end. The novel includes a long description of the torturous drive to the airport and the flight itself, where highly cognitive images of different types of crossings are accumulated. I quote, somewhere over there to the side, the place you can't quite see, he's completely there and not there at all, end quote. But this time I will focus on the cartographic language Veronica uses to describe her train trip uh, from London to Brighton, which is again representative of the way Enright Juxtaposes, juxtaposes landscape imagery and the literary ter uh, and the literary territory of affects. Here I am on the Brighton line on my way to collect my brother's body or view it or say hello to it or goodbye or whatever you do to a body you once lost. Pay your respects. It's a mellow autumn day. I look out the window and I'm surprised that the downs exist. There has always been something childish about England for me. Hayward Heath, uh, Wibblesfield, Burgess Hill, Hassocks, names so silly and twee, they must be made up. The constant surprise of this land that is actually green and actually pleasant, that is actually there. It moves past me, but at different speeds. Bits. In the middle distance, a strait of country, countryside moves serenely on, while the far, far, far hills run backwards slightly in a narrow strip. I try to find the line along which the landscape holds still and changes its mind, thinking that travel is a con contrary kind of thing, because moving towards a dead man is not moving at all. And after the train trip, the confrontation with the sea, 
the ocean her brother decided to walk into as his was an intentional death by water. Again, a sea that will not exactly unveil the secrets related to sexual abuse, but summarizes the emotional slash oceanic connection between siblings and the impossibility to decode the past or articulate a consistent narrative of such past the same way the water does not allow Veronica to see its depths. In the Green Road, the Morrigan siblings who have all immigrated from West Ireland to different countries are forced to come back home for a last Christmas as their mother has decided to sell the family house. Several trips are described and the language of cartography is a recurrent strategy to represent the emotions of displacement and erasure each character experiences during his comeback home. One of the characters, Dan, flies from Toronto to Ireland. The scene uh, before his departure, his arrival to Shannon Airport and the car trip home with one of his sisters become representative of the crossing of several borderlines. He crosses an ocean, he crosses from the land of pretended heteron heteronormativity to the territory of an open homosexuality, and he transgresses the solemnity of the family gathering by adopting a tone of joviality. Uh, Hello, Ireland, said Dan. Constance, the sister who picks him up at the airport, silently remembers one of her recurrent dreams, a scene where she and her brother as young children are on the beach of Lingish. I quote, coming around a headland to find something unexpected. And the thing they found was the river Inna as it ran across the sands into the sea. Sweet water into salt. Constance had been there many times as an adult, and the mystery of it remained for her. Rainwater into seawater. You could taste where the, they met and mingled, and no way to tell if all this was good or bad, this turbulence, if it was corruption or return. Again, the articulation of the oniric scene draws on the jargon of the geology of rivers and the blurring of limits and estuary constitutes. The depiction of the geological phenomena is intertwined with a nostalgia for an earlier period of life when moral judgment was decided, besides the point, but it's also telling of a present time when everything seems to have mingled, when her beloved brother is still her brother, but also other selves that escape her and where the uncomfortable presence of the word return links the description to an actual coming back to the motherland portrayed as a territory of unresolved effects. The examples selected from the three different novels by Enright will allow readers to draw an imaginary or meta map reaching beyond individual works and creating an each time more intricate web of geographical, cultural, and emotional movements of distancing as well as of attraction back to a center that no longer holds, at least not in the terms of traditional cultural discourses on identity, family as a social or re religious institution, or monolithic notions or on nationhood. As Hedwig Scholl states in her essay about Anne Wright's oeuvre, I quote, her writing interrogates the systems which frame people's perception, end quote. And I would add that her distinctive appropriation of a cartographic imagery that becomes almost obsessively recurrent in, is one more calibrated way in which the author achieves what Scholl calls a victory over sameness. Finally, and briefly, I will mention a third variety of literary mapping, the one which emerges after a specific type of reader, the translator, has made a literary work migrate to different linguistic and cultural spheres. And in this way, he, she, they contributes to the creation or, or expansion of the cartographies of literary re reception. 
Anne Wright's novels have been translated into many languages, including French, German, Italian, and Spanish. However, today I will focus on an ongoing international project, the Anne and Wright Ephesus Translation Project, coordinated by professors Hedwig Scholl and Henry Blumen from the University of Leuven. Uh, and in here you can see uh, the link to the, to the official web page. The project gathers writers, translators, academics, and students from all over the world, and its official web page is a platform where not only translate, translations are published, but also brief essays where each translator comments on her experience when facing the varied challenges posed by the act of transcreation involved in the, in the expansion of literary cartographies via translation. This way, translators engage in a fruitful discussion on the motivation of their choices and benefit from a network that encourages in-depth readings. As far as the Mexican team goes, I'm in charge of translating and writes short story, Night Swim, published in 2020, and supervising a group of translators who are working on five different uh, short essays from Making Babies, Stumbling into Motherhood, which was published in 2004, a selection of fragments which are in several ways linked to the story mentioned before. This project is an extraordinary opportunity to celebrate not only Enright's fiction and non-fiction writings, but also the specificities of Mexican Spanish in dialogue with the multifarious variations of the Spanish language across continents. We all expect to contribute via our mother tongue, emphasis intended, to the articulation of a Latin American cartography of literary reception that bears in mind the cultural references of the target language, as well as the preservation of an always disquieting element of estrangement and or displacement rooted in the elegant prose by Anne Enright. The threefold notion of literary mapping commented here as an approach to Enright's oeuvre echoes Professor Mario's idea that, and I quote, only when the map is realized as a conglomerate of evocative remembrances does it fulfill its ultimate pur purpose, the internalization of an experience of the world and in the world, end quote. And although this interpretation was inspired by his readings of Boland's poetry, it may indeed be associated to the analysis of Anne Wright's fiction. It's cartographic imagery, as well as the other maps readers may exact from it, including the porous lines, new lines and figures that emerge from the translator's pencil when expanding the frontiers of literary reception. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Pinheiro and Professor Mucha, such a lovely uh, enlightening moment for understanding uh, the readings, the possible readings of Boland and Enright. And I do have a few questions for both of you. And I'd like to start with the idea of the geography of effects. And um, by listening to uh, Mujia, Professor Mujia speak about the science of the cartography, I thought of transculturality and poetry, which was one of the topics uh, we had discussed locally uh, recently. Uh, and I would like to ask maybe both of you, because this also applies to Anne Enright initially, I'd like to ask whether you think the geography of effects has become some kind of, or has become part of some kind of unlimited poetic cartography. I mean, when we talk, when, when Professor Muja brings the linguistic aspects of translation, I'm thinking more about the elements of the, the cartography of effects and the themes that are present in both authors and how this gets transculturated or how does it get trans, translated, transcreated into uh, the specificities of different languages, in this case, Spanish. So that's one question. Uh, I have a few others, but um, I'll pass on the word to you, Luis. I wonder if Aurora would like to say something first. 
Uh, no, you start, Mario. <laughs> um, I I think I think that um, speaking of of uh, of both the the exchange and uh, transculturing of of ideas and and effects or feelings or sentiments is a uh, um, is, is, is a bit dangerous because of course um, n- not everyone thinks the same, not everyone feels the same and uh, of course those differences uh, tend to be uh, uh, increased if you will uh, if one travels from one from one nation to another, from one set of mind to another. Um, what I think is is very valuable here is the possibility of of translating thoughts, uh, experiences, sentiments, and effects in that regard. And I think that linguistically that is perfectly achievable, even if uh, the, the, the result of translation, whether it be uh, interlinguistic or extralinguistic or uh, uh, interlingual, if you will, uh, is, is, is is, is very different and varies from 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 translator to translator from poet to poet, and the difficulty increases when when the poet is also a translator or when the translator is also a poet, um, because then um, what happens there is, for example, the translator if 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 he or she is a poet, um, he becomes um, a writer of their own, if you will, and and then the uh, the result of, of the work is um, a poem in itself, uh, a, a different poem, uh, a, a poem that is different from the original, if, if, we can talk, if one can talk about original, but which also um, is intended to remain, quote unquote, faithful to the, uh, to, to, to the source, to the source piece, if you will. Um, and what one can do there as a reader, for example, or, or, as, a, uh, or as a critic or uh, as, as a scholar, if you will, is, is try to determine how those feelings and experiences and, and effects have been not only transmuted, but also translated and transformed from language to language and from mindset to mindset, which is the interesting bit. I don't know if Aurora agrees with me on that. Um, oh. Well, I, 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 this is a very interesting question because yes, I, I agree with Giselle that it is a, a, a problem. I mean, in the sense that there is a tension between the geography of effects in, in the culture of origin and the notion of transculturality in translation. Because even without a, within a single culture, the, the representation of a specific effect throughout time is not the same. It it, it changed. It, it is uh, it is not transhistorical. Then taking that representation of that specific effect to another cultural, uh, not only to another language but another cultural uh, context implies adapting, transcreating, manipulating sometimes the terms, the words, um, uh, uh, with, the, with the target audience in mind. Uh, for me personally, if I have to do so, I, I do it. Uh, I, 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 I take the decision of altering the original text a little bit um, um, and, and, and even uh, changing the, the, the word if, if it has to be done. Uh, in order to appeal and uh, in order to to really create, I don't want to use the, the word equivalent because I, I don't think that, that that's the best one, but in order to recreate the type of effect and the way I believe it would be received by the original audience in uh, amongst this second audience. What I'm saying is that if I have to take the license of altering the original a little bit more than usual, usual in my case, I'll do it. Um, because I think that, uh, that, that that is in a way the point. Uh, what I usually do when I'm translating into Spanish 
from a language such as English, I, I also check other translate, translations into other Romance languages like French or Portuguese or Italian to see what the translator, in case there, there is a, trans, a, a previous translation into those other languages, to see what the other translator did in this process of, uh, of moving a geography of effects towards uh, another territory with different cultural paradigms. And it, it, it usually helps to see how, how, how much they managed to, um, or how much they decided to, to be loyal to the original or not, and then I make my own decision. But, but of course, it, it's always hard to speak about these things like in general terms, because what we usually do is to, to, to make choices when, uh, with a specific text in front of us. Thank you, that's excellent to hear. Of course, I had in mind, as, I'm, as we were listening to your talk, I had a quotation from Boland and uh, Shimosini about uh, the country being the country of the mind. And then the fact that Boland migrated, immigrated, and that, that she was always here and there. And I got curious uh, about Murcia's um, translations and uh, making her, uh, making Boland know about your translations, Mujia. Have you ever had uh, contact with her? Have you ever told her, okay, this is one, <laughs> one curiosity? No, unfortunately not. Um, she, she sadly passed away before I could do that, but Eva Cruz, the translator, was actually in, in, in touch with her. And uh, according to what she says, she was, she was a very understanding and a very generous woman, uh, both in personal and in literary terms. So it makes it, it I, I think that that, that means uh, the, the process, the whole translational process what was made easier for, for, for Cruz in that sense. And um, um, speaking of effects, that, that is very important. Um, the, the, the manner in which you, um, you modify your, your practices, both a, a translator and a poet, when you're in contact with, with your source and uh, with, with, the, with the thoughts and experiences of the, of the writer, and in this case, the, the poet herself. And, and speaking of, of, of translating and, and uh, migrating, uh, both physically and practically, I, I think it is no coincidence that that we have been that both Aurora and I have been talking about the the figure of the mother here, which is which is a very important figure uh, in terms of of the effects, in terms of of, of sensitivity, if you will, um, for both nations, Ireland and Mexico, and the manner in which that figure is transported from one language and one. Um, set of ideas into another is, is something that deserves further consideration, I think. Uh, when, uh, Aurora, you, you, you made, uh, you mentioned an excerpt from The Gathering uh, in which the narrator says, there has always been something childish about England for me. And then she mentions uh, name places. And then after that, the constant surprise of the land. And again, I'm, I'm thinking about this transculturality, places and countries of the mind, and how, how it affects not only translation, but reading, reception uh, in the different languages. And in our case, in, in, as you're mentioning, Latin America, how does it feel for us? to read authors that are in, in the English language, coming from an Irish context and being tra transculturing, <laughs> being translated into our culture. So if you want to comment a bit on that, please, um, also related to the creation of cartography. So thank you. Um, uh, oh, yes, of course. Um, well, um, in, in the case of an example like this one, of course, uh, I, I keep the original names that are mentioned here and no attempt at translating neither characters, names, nor uh, the names of places uh, that are in an original, um, except for those that, that um, that, that have been translated in a certain way for a long, long time, but sometimes not even in those cases. I prefer to, 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 to keep those as in the original. And, um, and well, I mean, it, it's a bit, it's hard to answer that question because I think all of us here present uh, uh, 
have been reading literature in English for so long that it is kind of what we do every day. It doesn't feel like a distant or or foreign thing any longer. But 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 I um I also believe and and here I'm following Susan Sontag's idea that um translation does not have to achieve an absolute naturalization of everything, a radical naturalization of everything. Uh, um, uh, Susan Sontag liked it to say that it was good for a text to retain it, that for the, the, the text in translation that, or the, the, the already translated text to retain a little bit of the uh, of the element of of strangeness uh, of the of something that is not natural or native to the culture because that is also part of the experience of being aware of the fact that you're reading a translation. Um, uh, I think that for 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 a long time that uh, tr translators wanted to avoid that. Uh, but in more recent times, particularly from the 70s uh, uh, up to today, uh, the uh, prompting the awareness of the fact that the reader is reading a, translate, uh, a translation has become part of the art of translation. Uh, it, it is kind of a meta-translational element that may be included uh, in the text and that in a way keeps the air of something foreign without being unintelligible, okay? Okay, thank you. And Professor Muja, as a poet yourself, I think there are always questions like this to writers. Uh, usually people want to know if writers think about their readers as they are writing, and some of them will say never. <laughs> so I want to ask you as a poet translator, do you think of your local readers, or this doesn't really matter, <laughs> this is um, one curiosity. <laughs> I, I, I do think of them uh, sometimes, even if I don't know them, but I, uh, I, I would say that thinking about something else when you write is, is, is always tricky because of course you, you cannot possibly know everyone. Uh, you, you, kind of, you, you kind of get to imagine who is going to read uh, your your texts and and, and what you and you, what you write, but you can never be certain of that. Um, you can you can make yourself responsible for what you write, but you cannot make yourself responsible uh, for what other people's readings will be, if if, if you know what I mean. So um, so so yes, I, I I think of 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 potential readers, but but I I also think very selfishly of of what I want to say, and and more importantly, perhaps how I want to say it, so that it is not only uh, un understandable or or readable, but also um, moving, if you will, uh, not not necessarily in in the sentimental sense, but also in the in the intellectual one. Excellent. And one final question for both. Uh, do you think talking about cartographies and geographies of the mind and not just uh, geographies of the heart affects, um, do you think our contemporary times can bring us some new cartography? In, and I'm thinking about how, for example, Asian people look at the map, at, of, of the, at the world map, which is totally different from the way we view in the West. Uh, and I'm thinking about transculturality. So I'd like to hear your final word on this, please. Uh, well, I think that one of the many healthy things we have learned from cultural studies and particularly from the theory of effects and post effects, if, if we want to, to, to relate it to that, is not to establish uh, a traditional distinction between the mind and the sphere of effects, uh, to think of them uh, as a much more porous um, uh, flow uh, and, and, and when moving outwards and inwards. And, and, and in fact, the distinction outside and inside is altered by, uh, by the people who are specialists on the theory of effects. Uh, so in that sense, 
I don't think it is necessarily beneficial to, to establish a, a radical distinction between one sphere and the other. Um, in, in that sense, uh, the, the, the way Mario was using the word moving, uh, in, I think it is a good example because it, it, it may be moving in terms of effects, but also moving in the sense of mobilizing ideas. Uh, I do think that the two writers that, that we discussed today, the tremendously intelligent and talented women, the writer, their writings always provoke both things. Um, um, they never go for the easy emotional in the sense of trivial uh, uh, appeal uh, at readers, but they, they always they always produce this uh, porous contamination of spheres and in fact question the, the systems that, uh, that provoke our perception of those spheres as separate ones. Um, and, uh, and they do so uh, with, with an awareness and, and, uh, or, of a search for the beauty of language in both cases. Uh, because Anne, Anne writes uh, uh, prose may be tremendously poetic, even when she's been relentlessly ironic, um, and, 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 and when she may produce blunt sentences with a staccato rhythm, but anyway, she's been poetic in that, in that sense. Uh, so I think there is, for me, there shouldn't be a strict uh, division between these two, and, and they are uh, writers of ideas at the same time that ideas includes everything, the body, uh, the, 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 the corporeality of the experience, and, uh, and the physicality of the writing on the page or on the screen. And sorry, if I may add something. Um... We also need to take into consideration that now information is more readily available and that contact um, is, is, is much more um, is much more at hand, if you will. Uh, there, are, there are speedier ways to, to get in touch with one another. And that has actually changed the way in which we uh, see and consider distance, if you will, and, and spatiality um, in, a, in a way that works very much the way that poetry works because poetry brings the world to us. Um, so, so this kind of, of new uh, communication, if you will, I mean, it's not new anymore. It has been happening for a couple of decades now, but th this, this, this way of communicating more, more immediately, more, um, more speedily um, actually uh, resembles the manner in which verse um, affects our lives, if you will. So um, I, I think it has been uh, a very positive way of revisiting the, uh, the idea of space, the idea of distance, but also the idea of poetry and literature in general. And even in practical terms, our uh, contemporary access to archives as readers makes it possible, the, the digitalized archives makes it possible for any reader to, to find out things related to the text uh, he or she is reading or translating or, or, or interpreting. So yes, yes, I, I agree that that is also another element to take into account. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great honor and pleasure to have you with us. And I do hope we can meet again and continue our sure. conversations on such wonderful themes. Uh, hopefully presentially. Yeah, <laughs> so, so thank you I. very much. <laughs> thank thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you, you much. everyone. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.